I want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you uh, the word of His glory. Today we will continue our study in the book of Mark. Uh, tonight we're in chapter 8, and as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Okay, let's get into uh, the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. We're going to see Jesus create another miracle with the bread and the, and the fish, and we're going to see this is a whole different audience. This is going to show you the dual covenant, covenant to the Jews. Remember, we saw in earlier verses that there was uh, fed the 5,000 uh, and had five loaves, and the, let what was left over was 12. 12 is the number of completion for Israel always. Five is grace. Two is uh, is a covenant, or two, uh, two, two words, my uh Two witnesses, my word is established. So we're going to see that this is a Gentile audience. The Lord is taking it to the Gentiles now. So this will be the covenant with the Gentiles. Here we go. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. So they continued with him for three days. Again, three is the number of the Trinity. And uh, they had nothing to eat, so they were worrying about their, their, their livelihood, you know, nourishment from, from, from drink and, and to eat. And, and if I send them away hungry to their houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Uh, then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? So they're asking the same question again. The, the, the disciples are a little slow. They're, they're taking a little bit of time to catch on that this guy is more than just a, a, a guy. This is uh, the son of God. This is the Christ. And he's going to ask point blankly here in a moment, who do, who do you think I am and who do people think I am? And he's showing him that he is God in the second head. So he, they, they saw the, 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 the same miracle before. And now they're questioning, well, where are you going to get the bread and the, the fish from this time? And he's going to show them. Um, verse 5. And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Seven is the number of completion. Remember the completion. The completion of the, of, of the Gentiles is what Paul talks about. And once the completion or the fullness of the Gentiles, that means every single Gentile that is able to accept the Lord Jesus Christ with their heart because God is the Alpha and Omega, the Alpha, the Tav, the, the beginning and the end. He sees the hearts. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. He knew us while well, we, we were in our mother's womb. He knew us before the foundation of the earth. We have free will, but he knows what we're going to do. And there's a number, as Paul talks about, and it's called the fullness of the Gentiles. And once that number is full, and only God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit are the only three that know it. And that is going to usher in the rapture of the church. The Holy Spirit will come up, come up to heaven. There will be no Holy Spirit on the earth. The, church, the remnant, the church of Philadelphia will be gone. And literally all hell breaks loose on earth. And then it, and then it said, as, as in their affliction, they will seek my face and I will return to the place I left, as the prophet said. He's referring to Israel. He will turn back to Israel, and in their, they'll get it right the second time. And we see in the book of Revelation where the two witnesses come. I believe Moses and Elijah. Um, we're going to talk about Elijah a little bit because they know in Malachi that Elijah is, is, is coming. They will be witnessing that the Christ is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Yeshua, and they, the, the remnant of the Jews will, will know it. And the 12,000 tribe. Uh, of each tribe, of the 12 tribes, uh, the 144,000 that are supernaturally marked by the, by the Most High will be going out witnessing that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of hosts. So the Jewish people, the Jewish remnant, after the fullness of Gentiles has taken place and these events happen, will we'll understand and will know that he is the Christ. There are more Jewish people coming to Christianity and accepting Yeshua, Messiah, than any time in the history of the world. So we see God's plan in action. It's glorious. Uh, up until only a couple of years ago, you, you couldn't have a church in Jerusalem. Now there's Christian churches in Jerusalem. Now there's people that are open in their heart. Remember R R Rab Rabbi uh, Kadori uh, on his deathbed had a vision of who the Christ was. And it was an uproar in, the, in, in Israel and in all the uh, Judaism and the rabbi. He, he put the note secretly who the, who the Messiah was. 
And uh, after the year, after a year, which is the second, uh, the, the second part of uh, the, the ceremony of death for loved ones in the Jewish tradition, uh, to open up the letter. And the letter that he saw was Yeshua. And that threw everybody through an uproar, saying that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Even the top rabbi did at that point. And more and more are coming. More and more are starting to see the word of God. I think I mentioned it in one of our other studies that uh, two of the highest ranking um, rabbis in Israel today have said two very important things. One, they believe that the imminent return of the Messiah is near. Remember, they missed, the, uh, missed Jesus as the Lamb of God. They're looking for the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But in the book of Yasser, in the tradition of Jewish people, they've always been thinking, they've been looking for two, a Messiah ben uh, Joseph and a Messiah ben David. Ben David means uh, son of David, son of Joseph. They think in the line of Joseph and in the line of Judah and David. Well, we know that Jesus Christ fulfills the, the line of David through Bible prophecy. And the Lord put it on my heart uh, many years ago. And I asked, well, why are they confused about two? And he, he put it on my heart that that one Messiah, that th those two that they're looking for is literally one. Jesus fulfills both. Because David was his literal line of the bloodline through Mary because Joseph, his stepfather, gave him the legal line, but there was no bloodline. So Joseph was his legal father, and David was his father in genealogy of the bloodline. So one Messiah fulfilled both. Why do I make that a big deal? Because just recently, two of the highest ranking Messiah or uh, rabbis in Israel just came out and said, we've got it wrong. It's not two Messiahs, it's one Messiah that's coming that will fulfill both houses and praise glory. God is showing his, his ways uh, to be true right before our very eyes. So he, he commanded in verse six, the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks. You know, he always gives thanks to God the Father. Seven again is the number of completion. Christ is coming to complete his ministry to the Gentiles. That is the completion. And um, so that's why we see in the book of Revelation, there's over a hundred sevens mentioned in the book of Revelation. What is the book of Revelation? It's the revelation of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it's the completion of the world and entering into eternity with the Most High. First, the thousand year reign, fulfilling the Davidic covenant, and then after the white throne judgment, eternity with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's why you have so many sevens in the book of Revelations. It's overwhelmingly seven is the number of completion. So every number, every color, every yacht and tittle means something. And Jesus said, and as he said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, he will, he will, he will not come and replace the law and the prophets. He will come and fulfill it to every yacht and tittle, meaning very, very precise. And every prophetic word will be done. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to them uh, as before, again, the fish, uh, several in the Greek would, would be two to three, um, and that would also be of witnesses. These are witnesses. My, out of two or three, my witness is established. And we're going to see where a heresy in the church comes up that, uh, that is taken out of context. And for any doctrine to be built in the word of God, you have to have it by two witnesses. You have to have another place in the Bible that supports that doctrine. And if you follow our, um, the Trinity and the blasphemies of the Holy Spirit on www.hisglory.tv, they blaspheme the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll see the blasphemies of denominational teaching, certain de de denominations teaching, and how they built their entire doctrine on one verse of the Bible. And the scripture tells us, no, you can't take the Bible out of context. You don't add to or, or take away God's word. And it has to be established by two witnesses for his word to be truth. So you have to find that doctrine somewhere else. And it's usually in the old and, and one in the new. In a lot of cases, it's there a, a third time as well. They ate and were filled, and they uh, so they also had few, the small fish, and he, he said it before them. They ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. So in the Greek, this is not just, okay, they had a piece of, of, of bread and a little bit of fish. This is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. They were full. They were, as Thanksgiving, unbuttoned the top button of their Levi's, that they ate as much as they could fill themselves. And uh, there was uh, seven large baskets. This Greek word for basket is different than the other one in, that, were the, that were the twelve. So there was more that was left behind in the basket to this one than there were the Jews 
or the, to the, the first one with the Jewish people. So this is for the Gentiles because the word basket here means a, like a hamper, a huge basket, where the other one uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the five loaves and the two fish was a small basket. So this is a much different, even though the number is different. Seven, again, is the number of completion, the completion of the, of the Gentiles. First, his ministry was to the Jews. They rejected him. His ministry went to the Gentiles. The call of the church is to go and call upon and share the gospel from east to west to north to south until that day comes where the fullness of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. We don't know what that number is. And when that number is, that will start the event. We know it soon because Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our very, uh, before our very eyes. That's why every single time a new Christian comes in and accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's like shock therapy for Satan. He, gets a, he starts getting a shock. He doesn't know, is that the last one? If that's the fullness, he knows Bible prophecy. He knows the Bible. He knows that he's got seven years from when that, bo that point happens and his time is up. And he is going to be frantic. He's frantic today because he knows the last outpouring of the Holy Spirit is upon us. So if we have a great, huge revival of the Holy Spirit from east to west to north to south, and his glory nation shines all over the world, bringing in a harvest of millions of people, Satan's in huge trouble because that fullness will get, the Gentiles will get full real quick. And we know that's the last end time pouring out. For those who have eaten, we're about 4,000, and he sent them away. The number four represents the world. So this is a representing of 4,000, the number four, the glory of the Lord, his gospel being shed to the whole world. Now we, we, we say that today, um, you couldn't have said it before uh, because there are certain places and tribes that would never know the, the, the gospel. And uh, now with modern technology, you can get uh, through the internet or satellite TV, literally Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes uh, that the gospel is being shared in every single part of the world. As a matter of fact, there was just a report that this, this, uh, this group of a, a tribe of people that had never been outside of their group of people inside the, um, the Amazon, uh, some uh, human, got, uh, some uh, uh, somebody got into them and talked to them for the first time, and they found a Bible amongst amongst this tribe. So even that tribe that was so uh, away from the world and in in that uh, situation somehow had a Bible of the Lord. So they they know the Lord's day. They know the Lord is is one, and His day is coming. Verse ten. Immediately they got in the boat and into the disciples. He came to the re region of Delmanthetha. Verse 11, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. So they're coming out and seeking a sign from Jesus when he's given them all these signs, signs and wonders. If they'd known the prophecies of the book, they know he's born in Bethlehem. Uh, everything is being fulfilled of Bible prophecy right before their very eyes. And uh, that, they're not getting it. There was over 343 verses in the Bible that Jesus had to fulfill in the first covenant of his death as the, as the lamb. And he has fulfilled that to every yacht and tittle. And they're missing it. They knew the scriptures. They knew the scrolls, but they're hardened of heart. So they have the audacity, just show me one more sign. Sometimes we're like that in our walk with Christ as well, with, with our love for the Lord. We, we see a sign and we know it's from God and there's no doubt about it. And then we go through our times of trials where Satan is trying to doubt the word of God. He's trying to attack us when we're spiritually down, to doubt that we really know God. And those are the times where we need to go back and, and build ourselves up with his word because his word is above his name. And not only his word of the 66 books of his word, the Bible, but also that special time that he told you something or shared something to you that you know was from the Lord. That's why we need to have our own personal journal. And when those things happen to us in our life, we create this personal journal that we know is supernatural, that no way it could have been fulfilled any other way but the Most High God. And those times of trouble, when Satan is going to put doubt in your life, you go to the Word of God, the 66 books, and you go to your journal and you say, Satan, there's no way. There's absolutely no way that this did not happen only by the hand of the Most High God. It's supernatural and you're not going to fool me, Satan. Get away, get, get away from me, Satan, as Jesus is going to show Peter in a moment. Uh, but he sighed deeply in his spirit. What does this generation seek a sign? Surely I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation, this generation of, of, of those who are blinded. 
And he left them, and getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. Verse 14, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So if we know the Bible, the expositional constancy that we talk so many times about is just a fancy theological term to say the Holy Spirit is always consistent with numbers, colors, symbols, and idioms. Leaven always represents in the bread sin. It's always sin. Sin in two ways. One, it is the yeast. Leaven is yeast. What does yeast do to the bread? It puffs up. Puffing up is pride. That was the first sin. Satan was thrown out of the heavenly realm. He was the chief cherub, and he was thrown out because of his pride. He wanted to be like the most high God, and he rebelled. So that, that leaven there is puffing up. And if sin is not controlled, it spreads throughout the entire loaf. That's why Paul tells us how to properly uh, handle sin within the church in a loving manner. But it has to be dealt with. It has to be judged. You know, some people say that, you know, they take the scripture out of context and say, it's only up to the Lord to judge. That is true. Only God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit can judge the heart of salvation. And only Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, and the Holy Spirit can judge outside of the church. But his word is true, and he gives us a way to judge the sin inside the church. We're not judging them from salvation standpoint, but God's precepts and commandments, if somebody is not doing that, Paul shows us steps in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, how to handle that in love. But we are supposed to do that in love when somebody that calls himself a Christian is, is creating leaven that is spreading throughout the loaf because it will do danger to the entire church if it's not dealt with in a loving, spiritual way that's, that is fulfilled by uh, God through his word. Uh, then the reason among himself is because we have no bread. So they completely missed it. They think, well, he's saying this leaven about uh, the Pharisees and Herod. It's probably because we didn't bring enough bread. Why shouldn't we should have stopped at Walmart on our way and got another uh, another case of bread? No, they com completely missed it. Jesus is referring to the the, the content or the the the, the, um, the the their heart, the heart of the Pharisees and the heart of of Herod. Their heart, their harden of their heart because they're living for self. They're living for pride. Their pride is puffing them up. The leaven is raising and it's spreading throughout the loaf, spreading throughout all of, 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 of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. All of Herod's kingdom is being spread because of this false pride and sin and the loaf. That's what Jesus is talking about. And they're thinking about literal bread. Uh, verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Saying, you got eyes. Didn't you see what I did? Didn't you see what I showed you? You have ears. You heard all these miraculous things. You have seen things that no others have seen and, and have heard things that no others have heard. And my word is truth. I'm fulfilling the, 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 the law and the prophets to the yacht and tittle. Uh, having eyes, do you not see? Verse 19. When I broke the five loaves for the five, the 5,000, that was representing the first time to, to the Jewish nation to the Jewish people, the Jewish, uh, the J Jewish uh, peace. Uh, the five is, again, grace. How many baskets of full fragments do you take up? They said to him, 12. 12, again, showing you the completion of Israel. So that was Jesus' first miracle of the fish and the bread was to a audience of the Jews. There's two covenants, two covenants that the, the Lord has. He has a covenant to the, the, to the Jewish people, and he has a covenant to the, to the Gentiles, to the church. And there's two covenants, but one door, and that door is one Messiah, and that Messiah is Jesus Christ. But there are two covenants, and that is what he's telling us. Also, when I broke the seven, of the, seven for the 4,000, seven is completion, four is the world. Completion of the Gentiles and throughout the whole world is what he's saying. Um, and, the, and the large baskets full of fragments, didn't you take up? And they said, seven, seven again, completion. And these were larger baskets. And he said to them, how is it that you don't understand? He says, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So they took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. So the reason he spit 
He does this in other places where he spits and puts, uh, puts it in the mud and puts it on the eyes. Um, because it, it's a Jewish tradition that the firstborn of every single tribe and, and tribe and, and, and nation of, of Israel has a supernatural uh, ability in the saliva of their mouth. That's why he did that, to fulfill the, the Jewish tradition and show that he is the firstborn of God the Father and he is, a, he is the Jewish Messiah. He is Yeshua, the Messiah, uh, the, the king. Then he put his hands on his eyes and made him look up, and he restored and saw everything clearly. Verse 26, Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the, the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Jesus again said, Don't tell anybody yet. It's the, the God's timing is absolutely perfect. He wanted to move it out exactly that way. Um, so now Jesus, is uh, with his disciples, went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea is on the area of the Mediterranean Sea. That's where the Romans, that's where Pilate was stationed. That was his headquarters. Pilate and Herod would only go into Jerusalem for the, for the festivals. So they went there seven times uh, a year uh, with the seven festivals to make sure that, the, that nothing got out of hand. It was reported back to, to Caesar. Uh, this was named after Caesar. That's why it's called Caesarea. And that's where they found Pontius Pilate's actual Senate seat, showing that Pontius Pilate literally existed. And there's a statue uh, in Caesarea today uh, of Pontius Pilate. And you can see the old Senate uh, seat there. We did a, 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 a sermon right there in the Mediterranean Sea in Caesarea in, the, in Pilate's um, Senate of the Romans. And the real Senate seat is in the uh, Israeli Museum as we speak today. So God is fulfilling this literally. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? So he's going to ask them, who do men say that I am with all these miracles and all that's going on with this, the, you know, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even, even people like Herod who thinks he was, in, he was the second coming uh, of the, re, the rebirth of John the Baptist. So, so they answered him, John the Baptist. So that's from the Herod part. But some say Elijah and others, one of the other prophets. So uh, some say Elijah because in Malachi, uh, the, 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 we know that Elijah will come in, in, in the end days, in the end time. Um, that's why the Jewish people in Passover set an extra plate for Elijah uh, d during Passover, the Feast, of, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruit, the First Fruit, the Passover First Fruit, and the, and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They set an extra plate for Elijah because they know in Malachi that Elijah will come back in the end days. The other one, the other, uh, the other um, uh, witness in my conjecture is Moses. Some think it's Enoch, but uh, either or, Elijah most certainly is one of them, and he, that's why they're saying uh, you're Elijah or another prophet. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him saying, you are the Christ. And in the Hebrew, he's saying, you are the Messiah. Now in Matthew 16, this is... Again, uh, out of two witnesses, my word is established. So there is a, there, there is a, a denomination that after Jesus says this in Matthew 16, the, and Peter says, you are the Christ, and Christ says, only God from heaven could give you that knowledge to know that. Uh, I, on, on that, I will build my church. And the Catholics have taken that verse out of context in Matthew. And if it was truly meant to be that, that Peter was the first pope, then God would have put it in two or three places to establish it as his witness. But he, they only take one verse to show that as Peter is the first pope. And there's many reasons wrong with that. First of all, they took it out of context. What Christ was talking about was a pun. Yes, Peter's name was Rock, but he was talking about what he said before. Who do people say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And he says... On that doctrine, on what you said, I will build my church, that I am the Christ, that I am the Messiah. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only way to God the Father. We have to take the Bible in context. And the, exactly the way Jesus was, was explaining, he says, on that doctrine, I will build my church. The doctrine that he is the, the Christ and the gospel spreading from east to west to north to south, as Paul would say, the gospel explained in Galatians is that according to the scriptures, Christ died, 
He was buried, and on the third day, according to the scriptures, rose again. That is the gospels that were spread east to west and north to south, and that the only way is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the light. He's not saying Peter is the first pope, and he's not building the, 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 the church of Rome on, and the Roman Catholics on Peter. Matter of fact, we go back to history, the first four, four centuries of the Catholic church didn't even mention Peter about that. And also, if you want to get really into it, the book of Romans, Paul is, is, it never mentions Peter once. And matter of fact, we see in Paul's epistles that he rebukes Peter for, because Peter was, was siding more with the Jewish people. And we're going to see what Jesus says in uh, Matthew after this, the next sentence after he says that, when Satan grabs Peter and he rebukes, it, he rebukes Peter in the name of Satan. So we show you that how you have to put the Bible in context and taking one bit of the Bible and throwing that doctrine against the wall and saying something from a denominational perspective is wrong. It's theologically wrong, it's blasphemy, and it is absolutely historically wrong, and it also is biblically wrong. They take it out of the context, and it is not proved by two, of my, two or three of my witnesses. And if there's a good book on that called um, uh, the, the Woman Who Rode the, 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 the Woman That Rode the, the Beast, and that's done by David Hunt. And some will say, well, that's an anti-Catholic uh, book. No, every single piece of that, of that book was given to him by people within the Catholic Church. So it was the Catholic Church that actually gave all the content for The Woman That Rides the Beast by Dave Hunt. And it's a very good read because it shows you the true history of the Roman Catholic Church. And it shows you in, in, in what went wrong and what went right and where some of these, uh, these, these false doctrines came from. And Jesus, again, is saying unequivocally, on that doctrine, meaning that because you said, I am the Christ, I am going to build my church, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that is the gospel that they're required to spread all over. Then he strictly warned them that they should not tell anyone. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. <clears throat> so he's showing them, as according to Scripture, yes, I am the Messiah, but I come as a suffering lamb. As in Daniel, it says that he'll be cut off, he'll be killed, meaning the Messiah. He will be killed, not for his transgression, but the transgression of the people. So it's showing in the Old Testament, in many places, that the Messiah needed to be killed. It shows in... Um, Revelation too that uh, the, the the Alpha and Omega died and came, and who who died and came to, came back and that is the Christ that is the Messiah. He, so he's sharing with them that he must be the suffering Lamb the first time and fulfill Bible prophecy and then on the third day be the first fruit of God the Father. Sit as the high priest is what is talked about in the book of Hebrews and will come down the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah in the line of David to fulfill the Davidic covenant exactly as he says in Matthew 5, 17 to 18, to dot the I and cross the T, every yacht and tittle, fulfilling the Torah and the laws perfectly, uh, and the prophets. And he spoke the word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Peter had the audacity. He tried to do it in love, but sometimes Peter spoke before he thought. And he's trying to rebuke. No, 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 no. You're the Messiah. You're not going to die. You're, 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 you're here to put the government on your shoulders because that's what Isaiah said. They missed it, that they, he is the suffering lamb the first time. Second time, he comes as the king of kings, Lord of hosts, the kinsman redeemer, the goel, which is in Hebrew is the blood redeemer. He's going to redeem the blood once and for all. But when he had hurt, turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter by saying, get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of Theos, but the things of men. You're thinking of men's ways, not the, of the most high God. And he's rebuking. And remember, we find out later that uh, Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit allow Satan to sift Peter. That's why he denied, uh, he denied God or denied Jesus three times. One denial for each of the Godhead. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And we'll see later when the rooster crows, he looks in the book of Luke right at Christ as he fulfills what Jesus said he would do. Because he lets Satan sift him for a little while but Jesus says, I prayed for you and you'll come back. And that is our high priest. He's making intercession for us. And Peter got it wrong by speaking too quick. We do that sometimes as Christians. Let us not speak on our own behalf. 
Let's meditate on the Lord and have the Lord walk with us and, and walk in the name of Christ. Even though his intention may have been right, we speak only when God tells us to speak and we do it based on his word and his word only. For whoever desires to... Um, so he called the people to himself uh, and his disciples also. And he said to them, no, I'm sorry, verse 33, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Verse 34, when he had called the people to himself and his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So what does this mean? This is what for us Christians, we deny self. That means giving up our earthly wants and, 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 and wishes for ourself in this world. This is totally against what the world teaches us. I used to have a sign when I was a Fortune 100 director that says, if it's to be, it's up to me. And in a biblical walk, that couldn't be further from the truth. If it's to be, it's up to Christ and for me to give up self and love him with all my heart, my soul and mind and let him take my path. Let him lead me and let me be obedient and let me repent of my sins. Tell him and give them all to him. That's the, that is the way of spiritual walk. That's what Jesus is saying here. Whoever desires to come to him has to give up self. In your walk with Christ, the quicker you can give up self for him, the quicker you'll be uh, walking in his glory because that is part of our wilderness period to shape us and change us. Because remember, Jeremiah tells us, Everyone was born with an incurably wicked heart. We think of self. Satan uh, fell because of pride. It was vain. It was himself. It was his pride. And we all have that S-I-N positive in our DNA about thinking for self. And the more we can give up self and give it to his glory, more the Lord can use us. That's why he works us so many times in a day, asking this question over and over, how much do you trust me? That's why we go through trials and tribulations. If we have a, we have, if we have, a will for the Lord to do something mighty for him, we will go through trials and tribulations because he's training us. It's like boot camp. He's training our hearts to be given up self and be used for his glory. And we have to know his word. We have to be obedient to him. We have to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind and say, Lord, you lead me. You take off my, my yoke. As Jesus says, let me take your yoke because it, it'll be lighter for you. And the world throws a lot of heaviness on us. and We can't do it on our own. We have to have the Lord Jesus do that. And that's, a, that's the step of going to the glory, glorification stage. But whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever who loses life for my sake and the gospel will save it. So whoever desires to save his life in the fleshly world and live for the world will lose eternal life is what he's saying. Eternal life with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. We're not here to create the next iPhone. Yes, those are neat things and, and very important, but the most, the most important thing is only what we do for the name of the Lord. Once we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're on the clock now too. What are we going to do for his glory? We are to fulfill the will of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the will of our life. Once we match his will with our will, like we said, Isaiah said, I will do it, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. That's the way we need to be in our love with Christ. Whatever you want from me, Lord, that is my will of my life. And that is how I put you first and self last. And that's how my life will have everlasting life through you. And he says, who loses my life for my sake, loses the fleshly life for his name's sake, will have eternal life. We'll have eternal life with him through soul and spirit who are in heaven today. And when the rapture of the church, we will have, that we will be transformed. We'll, be have holy, uh, we'll have life in him, soul, spirit, and a new glorified body. So that's what the Lord is saying to you. We will do it in my name's sake and the gospel's sake, not denying the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the book of Philadelphia. That's why it's the remnant, the remnant of Philadelphia who will get harpazoed, who get raptured, because it says, you overcame. You did not deny my word, and you did not deny my name. And I have the key to David, and what I open, no one can shut, is what he says. You went through the trials and tribulations of life, but you never denied my word, the 66 word that is true, that's infallible. As Jesus said himself, I will, I will dot the I and cross the T in the English, the yacht and tittle in the Hebrew. He, you're, you never denied his word. 
and you never deny his name of being the most high God to the Son, Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And spreading that wonderful gospel, that's what the gospel means, that Jesus died according to the scripture, was buried, and then on the third day rose again according to the scriptures, is what Paul tells us in Galatians, to fulfill the gospel. That's the, that is the proper definition of the gospel, and we share the glory of Christ in the gospel from east to west to north to south, all over his glory nation. Praise his name. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will a man give to exchange your soul? You think about all the, the, the politicians and the greedy world leaders who have killed literally for power and greed and stolen and, 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 and taken from innocent people to, to get rich, to get powerful, uh, to have uh, money, power, authority in this world. And they think they've got the world licked. Remember in Psalm 2, the Lord God, the Father, sits in the heavens and laughs and says, no, that's not what it's all about. It's only what you do for me what it's all about. There's going to be a judgment coming, and those people will be judged, and they will be judged worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because they had the opportunity, and they did it for self-reasons, and they hurt people, and that punishment that they hurt people is going to be their punishment in, in, in the lake of fire. So it's only what we do in the name of Christ. Yes, we have secular jobs. We have to do secular things to, to, um, to provide for our families, but it's only what we do for Christ that really matters. That is what's going to show up on the Bema seat is what we did for Christ. And if we have salvation in our heart from Jesus Christ, we've accepted him as Lord and Savior, and we just go and sit on the, on the couch and eat Cheetos, and we get up to the Bema seat, and the fire is tried, our works are weighed, and the scales come back that it's empty. We're going to have that tear of regret because we didn't, we didn't use the talent and the will the Lord gave us. And that sets the tone of where our position will be in the millennial reign. It sets the tone, literally, the position that you will be in eternity. What did Jesus say in, in going back to the church of Philadelphia? He says, I will make you pillars in my holy city. So he's saying, because of these things that you did, these works that were my will for my glory, not denying my name, not denying my word, not having any strength in the world against you, I will make you a pillar, meaning you will be right next to me in, in the millennial reign and for eternity. That's why we work for the works of the five crowns for God after the salvation comes in. It's very important. And there are two different things. Grace and salvation is grace. That's a free gift. But once, once sanctification starts in and we're saved, we have eternal life, we work out of love for the Lord. Like Isaiah saying, whatever it is, Lord, because I love you and I'll do whatever you want me to do. Even go bare naked for three and a half years like, like, like Isaiah had to, just covering up his loin, that was it. Can you imagine being a prophet of the Lord? And the Lord tells you, show my people Israel because they have a hardened heart. I want you just to have something that covers your genitals, but you're naked everywhere else. Your buttocks, the whole, for three, over three years, three and a half years. That's love of the Lord, whatever it takes. That's what Jesus is saying. Pick up the cross and do it for me. Do it for me. Do it for my will and put self last. Isaiah did that. You look at every person, a prophet in the Bible, they did the same thing. Look at Ezekiel. He was told, son of man, your wife is going to die tonight. Don't mourn. So he, and there was a period that Ezekiel couldn't mourn for the death of his wife. He couldn't, he couldn't talk to the people, so he had to act things out for a particular period of time. The prophets didn't have it. Great. But they loved the Lord, and they didn't deny his word. They did not deny the name of the Most High God, and they did not deny the word, and they did whatever the Lord wanted of them for him and for his glory. And that's what it was. They were working for the afterlife. They were working for the millennial reign. They were look, working for eternity because Isaiah saw the third heaven and it's glorious. And that's what the rewards we have for us once we do the will of God after accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Ask him your will. And it says in scripture, if you ask of me what your, my will is, I will tell you. It tells us that in scripture. Verse 38, we close out Mark 8. It says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when it comes in the glory, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So he's saying, Whatever's in dark, light will shine upon it. If you are ashamed of me, meaning ashamed of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, 
then he's not, he's, he, you're not going to have it. That when God the Father and the holy angels come, they're going to deny it. You will be denied. We have to stand strong in the name of Jesus Christ, even to death. We are his children. We are called on sons and daughters once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we're called to carry the cross, not to deny my name, not to deny my word. And whatever the political world is telling us to say or do, no, the word of God, the word of the 66 books is truth and never changes. Our God is God of love and we obey him, not man. We listen to him, not man. And we do never deny the name or the word of God. And we never deny the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God the Father, or the Holy Spirit. We pray that Mark 8 has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you till next time in Mark 9. God bless.